Welcome to the Honest Designers Show, your transparent look into life as a modern designer. My name's Tom Ross, and I'm the founder at designcuts.com. And this week, I'm joined by my fellow Brit and hand lettering expert, Ian Barnard, American retro design expert, Dustin Lee, and the incredibly talented South African illustrator, Lisa Glantz. This week, we're joined by Blair Ends, who has spent more than a decade in new business and account management for some of the world's largest advertising agencies and some of its smallest design firms. He is also passionate about helping fellow creative entrepreneurs and an expert on pricing. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Blair, thank you so much for joining us, man. Oh, it's my pleasure, Tom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here. Of course, of course. We were chatting just before this. I'm really eager to have you on. We've all been excited for it because we self-admittedly probably uh, have a bit of a weakness when it comes to attracting clients, um, pitching ourselves. I realize your company is called Win Without Pitching, but we're hoping you might shed some light on this difficult area. I think it is a real sticking point for so many of the listeners, and we tend to just shrug and go like, well, I don't know. We just kind of figured it out and did it by word of mouth. It sounds like you're a little bit more strategic about that. So I'd love if you could maybe give a bit of your background for the listeners um, with how you've become somewhat of an expert in this field. Yeah. Somebody once said to me years ago, um, I hear you're an expert on new business. You know what to say after hello. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, so I grew up professionally in the advertising agency business, and then near the end of my agency career, went to work for a design firm. I started out in account management and very quickly discovered I had an aptitude for new business. So I went to um, moved into new business roles. And then in um, around the turn of the century, I like saying that. It makes me feel really old. Around the turn <laughs> of the last century, I I decided I wanted to drop out. I'd kind of given up on advertising in particular at that time. And I wanted to drop out and I discovered this little mountain village in the middle of nowhere in British Columbia, Canada. And I decided that um, my wife and I decided we were going to move there and raise a family. And I, I couldn't quite figure out how to, uh, how to earn a living. There's no, the, the only real industries here are logging and dope growing. And I wasn't very good at either <laughs> or had no experience in either. So I decided to la launch a new business consultancy called, um, win without pitching. And, um, uh, to my, uh, delight, uh, I succeeded, got some traction very early, um, and, uh, published my first book, the Win without pitching manifesto in 2010. And we can come back and talk about that. Oh, and that kind of, you. yeah, it kind of put me on the map globally. And then in 2013, I decided, um, I needed to change the business model because the business model I felt was trying to kill me. So I thought I would kill it first. <sighs> and so I switched from being a solo consultant to pivoting, uh, when without pitching to a training company. So since 2013, we've been, we're effectively a sales training organization for creative professionals. And I know I, I embrace the S word because I know creatives despise it. Mm. And one of our principles oh, yeah. is to lean into the dark places and this, the word sales is a dark place in the creative profession. So we Definitely. kind of lean into it and embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. We hear that a lot. Um, we, we try and mentor and help as many creative professionals as possible. And you're completely right. I think we did a whole, I think it was two episodes recently about being an entrepreneur versus a creative and that business versus creative side. And it scares the hell out of so many creatives. And, and we kind of pitched that was needless. You know, it's, um, it, it shouldn't always be terrifying. There's a lot of positives in the business side and in the sales side, you can even get creative mm -hmm. with it. What are your thoughts on some of the, the positives when it comes to pitching and why it doesn't have to be so scary? Yeah. I don't think there's anything positive about pitching. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, you know, says the guy whose book in business is called win without pitching. I don't, I also don't think pitching is the problem. I think pitching is the symptom of the problem. And the larger problem is that the typical creative has very little power in the buy-sell relationship. So 
when buyer and seller, when the creative and the prospective client come together to determine whether or not they're going to do business together, it's typically the client that has all that power. Mm. And a symptom of that is the fact that the client can dictate to you how your services will be bought and sold, can dictate profit margin, can even dictate to you how the engagement's going to go once you're hired. So my whole professional career is about changing the power balance, getting some of that power back and changing the way that your services are bought and sold. And ultimately, not only becoming more effective at selling your services, but becoming better at what you do. Because you'll hear me say probably a few times today, the sale is the sample. How you conduct yourself in the relationship before you're hired is a sample to both you and the client of how you will behave once you're once you're hired, the uh, the roles are established in the sales cycle. So learning to do this well is vitally important to actually doing good work. So true. I really like that, actually. And yeah, it is so true. Um, mm. A lot of that, I guess, comes down not only to human interaction, but things like brand. That's all part of the sales cycle. It's part of that early experience the client gets, which then maps out the, uh, you know, the predicted experience down the line. Yeah, I cringe when I hear the word brand being used to describe a creative firm. And I know Tim Williams wrote a very good book on positioning for creatives called Take a Stand for Your Brand. And there's nothing in that book that I take issue with um, because what he's essentially saying through the title is you, you really should be as serious about positioning your business as you are as in positioning one of your clients' brands or products. But I do think it's a mistake to think of your firm as a brand simply because um, so much of the brand work that we so we do, like we in the creative and marketing professions, we're, we're very often dealing with um, mature brands that have very little, little tangible product differentiation. Therefore, we tend to fall back on personality. So we see branding as an exercise in bringing out the personality of the brand. And that's just a mistake when it comes to positioning your firm. There's really only one meaningful basis for the positioning of your firm, and that is the depth of your expertise. The brand stuff, the personality, that I'm not saying ignore it, but it's a mistake to put that forward ahead of the more strategic exercise of positioning your firm. And you don't think you can you can find, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and it has a lot of... Um, you know, it makes perfect sense in terms of you want to you want to ready upfront indicate to the client of where you stand, where they stand. So it's like a bit of a power struggle. You also want to tell them, you know, what your expertise are. But at the same time, people deal with people. You know, like people buy from people. So, I mean, is it not something that you need to find a balance between, or do you just kind of only deal with the personality side of your business? I don't know, much later down the line. Yeah, it's well, it's the latter. I, I, I think Lisa, it's mm-hmm. um, it's not that it's unimportant, but it's the the that kind of the personality. That's those are secondary factors when it comes to okay. the decision to hire your firm. So I often say to an audience, finish this sentence: people from buy from people they blank, and almost everybody says like, and I say, Mm-mm, no, trust. yeah, people buy from people they think can help or trust that they can help. And even mm. tr- trust is important. I don't want to diminish the importance of, of trust. But at the you know you are an expert at what you do when the client sitting across the table who's considering hiring you looks at you and says, you know what? You're twice as expensive as the other firms I'm talking to you. And I really don't like you. But you're hired. <laughs> Th- that That is success. Now, I'm not trying to make the case that you should be anything under other than your wonderful selves. I'm not trying to give people liberty to be jerks, but I'm saying when we start leaning on personality, when we see personality, mm-hmm. like our personality, our likability, the personality of our brand as the reason people should hire us, and we, when we start emphasizing that, what we are communicating to our audience and to ourselves is our ability to solve the client's problem is no greater than that of anybody else you are speaking to. That's, that is the signaling that we are transmitting when yeah. we lean on personality mm. rather than the depth of our expertise. Yeah. I can, I can verify that in a way. I, I, 
I hire a lot of designers to do things for me. And one of my favorite designers I ever worked with was a, a guy named Chris DeLorenzo. He was not the best at getting back an email. He kind of dictated how things would go. And when he put out, he put out the work for me, I said, well, why don't you try this and that? And he said, I'll try that for you, but I'm telling you what I'm doing is the best. And just the way he did it, he was very confident in himself. And it wasn't that I liked him the best, although he's a nice guy. It was that he was confident and he was just like, this is the best, but I, I'll show you that mine's the best by showing you the other options. And that made an impression on me like years later. Yeah, that's, I mean, that just hearing the story, I can tell there's somebody that has a high degree of confidence and almost certainly a high degree of competence that is backing yep. that up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a mistake to think that we the creatives, we're in the service business. We're not in the service business. The customer is always right. The, and, and your default assumption as a creative, when a client comes to you self-diagnosed and self-prescribed, your default assumption should be that that's probably not it. You, you should, and it happens to me all the time, when a, when a prospective client comes to us, an agency principal, and wants to talk to us about our new business training, and, and they're, seeing, they're articulating the problem to me and what they see as the solution, my reaction, and I don't, I'm not so direct in sharing it with them, but my reaction is that's probably not it. You're, and and it's because you, you, the client is inside the jar, to borrow a, a client of mine's phrase, and they can't read the label. Yeah. So Ooh, you yeah, as the good. outside expert, the facilitator, <laughs> you have perspective. You have this outside perspective on the problem. And you have a professional obligation to bring that outside perspective to bear. So you're... Your assumption, and you have to be careful about the language you use, but when a client comes to you and says, my problem is X, I need Y, your assumption should be, it's probably not either, but let's validate, right? Let's validate. Yep. And, and so that's not in the service industry. You're taught to smile, nod yes, the client is already right, whatever the client wants, the client gets. That's, that's not the business that we're in. We're in the expertise business. Clients come to us with very real business challenges and they need business, they need solutions to help them capitalize on opportunity or deal with negative challenges. And we have mm -hmm. a professional obligation like any other professional does to diagnose before we prescribe. And so we should never find ourselves in a situation where we are nodding yes, thinking no. We're more like the car mechanic than the waitress. Yes. Can now I, let can me... I yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you a question about this, just to just to clarify? So, like, when um when I was researching your your book and kind of checking that stuff out, um, obviously you have like a big following of people that are designers, and would it be fair to say that designers in general should not build their business around a brand or a personality? Whereas, say something like more that's more like a commodity, like cheese, they might differentiate or batteries, for instance, they might differentiate more by personality and by how they do that is, do you find that this is a thing that goes, that's globally across all things or is design and businesses like that unique? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Any, it's my belief that any professional firm or any knowledge based business should differentiate based on the depth of their expertise. And there, there's some variables around that that we can talk about. So when you look at cheese, a cheesemaker, or you know, and that's a great example. A cheesemaker does their very best to make a a um, a high quality product, and then they're very quickly copied, mm -hmm. right? So some people can maintain a real product advantage through some sort of recipe or the quality of their ingredients or other factors, um, but very quickly in a consumer packaged goods world or a grocery world your product features are copied and brand becomes vitally important. Mm. And we make the mistake as folks who work on those types of brands and we, we, we tend to love as creative people, we love doing the brand personality work, right? So the default is when we start to turn that kind of thinking onto our own business, we immediately d default to personality. And there are other reasons for this too. Another reason is that Creative people, by their nature, want to build a business that serves their personal needs and in particular, their need for variety. So creative mm. people 
when well positioning said. their firm, they tend to, that's, that's why there's a glut of undifferentiated creator firms on the market, because there's this, there's this um, friction between the individual's need for variety and the business's need to focus. And so I talked about the value of your outside perspective when you're facing your client's challenge. Creativity is essentially perspective. Creativity is not, and this is, I'm quoting Mahai Csikszent Mahai, who wrote, he coined the, the term state of flow. So he wrote the book Flow. He studies happiness and creativity. So that idea of flow state where you're at your, you're at your happiest, mm -hmm. it's when you're pushed out to the edge of your abilities, but not beyond, you still have a sense of mastery, a sense of being in control. Time both speeds up and slows down. You have heightened senses. That's the flow state. Mm -hmm. And what, what Mahai Csikszent Mahai says is creativity is not the ability to write or draw. That's what he calls personal creativity. Creativity is the ability to see to bring a novel perspective to a problem. So if your your gift as a creative person is the ability to think differently about a problem. So if that is your gift, if that is your strength, you will go in search of the problem that you have not previously solved and your nature will be to craft your business in a way that allows you to solve problems you have not previously solved. But if you, as I've already said, the only meaningful differentiator is that is the depth of your expertise. If you want to build deep expertise, you need to narrow your focus okay. and start to solve the same types of problems over and over again. So there we get to the crux of the problem, mm -hmm. which is creatives want to do everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> but for your business to succeed and for selling to become easy, you need yeah. to build deep expertise, which requires you to narrow your focus. So positioning is not an exercise in language around personality. It's an exercise in sacrifice. From now on, we're going to solve these types of problems for these types of organizations. Yeah. Correct. Tell me if I'm wrong here, but I would imagine as people follow this path, I can picture reading this and, and, tr and starting to go through the steps of this. And I feel like where I would start to encounter resistance um, would be where... I'm forced into that one area because you do, you fight against yourself. You're like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to hate it. How am I going to ever focus on this one thing? Do, do you find that that's where the friction happens? Yeah. And, and I talk about this that? right in chapter one of my first book, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto. So the chapters are proclamations, the 12 proclamations of a win without pitching firm. The first proclamation is we will specialize. And what I say is, you, the metaphor is you're standing in a room full of doors and being a highly curious, creative problem solver, you want to know what's behind every door and you want to solve every problem behind every door. And I'm standing behind you over your shoulder and I'm saying to you, no, you need to pick one door, walk through it and never look back. And you are convinced that on the other side of that door is one long, boring, gray hallway <laughs> where we'll, you will die of boredom, right? That's the problem, yeah. right, Dustin? Yeah, totally. And, and, I, and I'm saying to you, you need to trust me. And that is not what is on the other side of that door. What is on the other side of that door is more doors than you can ever imagine in your life. And I like to say, it's not more door, it's more doors <laughs> than you can ever imagine. You crawl into a niche and it's like Narnia. It w opens up into a whole massive world. But as you're standing there as this generalist and trying on the idea of specializing, you're thinking, oh my God, this is the worst thing I could ever do to myself. I'm going to bore myself and my people to death. And that is not what happens. Well, can I, uh, can I, I feel like I'm, I'm talking too much compared to everybody else, but um, I have to verify, like, I think this is really true for my business. So my business is essentially selling design goods that are inspired by really like mid-century Americana. It's called Retro Supply, but it really focuses on that era in America. Um, so Great era. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when I, when I first did it, I didn't plan it to be a long-term business. I didn't think I'd be doing it five years later. But as it turned out, there, I thought, oh, there's maybe one, maybe like, maybe like five packs here, maybe 10 products here if I really stretch it. But as it turns out, it just starts branching and branching and branching and branching. And five years later, we've got like 100 products and still more to go. And pe like I talked to like an attorney there and he was like, I can't believe there's actually an area to actually carve out a living doing that. Mm. Yeah. I, I love it. You're, you're one of my favorite examples of a mm. successful niche. 
Dustin, and I, I love it because they're so powerful. And Blair, what you're saying is you've got Narnia behind door number seven, for example, and that's endless doors. But what a lot of people are doing, and I know a lot of the listeners are doing, they're stood there deliberating for years, looking at 12 and never yeah. picking one of them. So it's like endless doors versus 12 and not really exploring those 12. Like if you try and target everyone, you target no one. And so many people are paralyzed by that. We hear it all the time from the listeners. Mm. They just never make a decision because they're too scared to niche down because they feel like that's me, I'm done for life then. How much yeah. of that niche though, specializing down is linked into what you're passionate about? Or is it looking at, because also you have your passions on one side and then you have your strengths on another side. And sometimes those are, you know, linked and some are like, you know, because you could be passionate about, um, uh, you might like, I don't know, doing watercolored paintings, but you might not actually be that good. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that makes obviously sense. you don't want to create a, a niche or a business that's focused on something that bores you to death. But I'm fond <laughs> of saying, you know, I, th I think human beings are hor and this is proven repeatedly, human beings are horrible predictors of what they will or will not like. Mm -hmm. mm. So you sit there and think, oh, I can't do that. Like I'm convinced a designer wants to solve the problem and save the world. That's, that's what, I, what I love about designers is, and that's how I can describe it. A designer wants to solve the problem and save the world. And when you start your design business, the problems that you're most interested in solving at the beginning are your client's problems. But at some point, when you become a real entrepreneur, the most interesting problem is your own business model. Dude, that is so I true. feel <laughs> the same way. Like, okay, so I, I, I go, I do, I, I do courses at um, like web, um, conferences sometimes, and it's called like Passive Income for Designers. And it's just about like not trading time for money. And I'll always be like, they'll be like, well, I don't want to focus on a certain thing. And I'll be like, it becomes way more interesting once people start paying you. Like all of a sudden it becomes infinitely interesting. And like the more <laughs> people pay attention and give you money, the more like it becomes a fascinating problem. Sorry, you just got me really excited because I'm, <laughs> so, so feel, I'm feeling you there. I'm really feeling, yeah. believe that. But it's so true, yeah. I think some designers need to let go of the idea of, of owning a design firm of being a, like a fee for service graphic designer or a web designer. I, I once did a, uh, well, I've done this a bunch of times, a, a workshop with a bunch of people around, um, alternative business models. So maybe it was, maybe we just touched on it, but, um, I think maybe it was around positioning. So everybody's coming up with these like new strategies for the business. And I had them do some kind of fast track exercises around just identify opportunities you see in the market. And this one woman came up with this incredible business opportunity. And when she explained it to the room, everybody went nuts. And we all just started riffing on the things that she should do in this business. And every, so there's 30 of us in the room and 29 of us are excited and going back and forth with all of these great ideas and how you could, this business could be massive overnight. And the woman who volunteered was, the idea was sitting there quietly and she wasn't very happy. <laughs> and I knew what was wrong, but I asked her and she, she said, well, you know, the problem is the idea she came up with would require her to no longer own a design firm. And she was a solo practitioner. She was essentially a freelance designer. And the, pro the real problem was she wanted to go home at Christmas and tell her family, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. The money in the design world is on the other side of the business when you design products and services, right? So when you're yeah. not hired on a fee for service, fee for service basis when when you become the client so i think some some creative people you look at your role models who are you know maybe the famous graphic designers web designers etc um and you think yeah i, I want to model my business after them and you, and you skip over these incredible business opportunities to apply your creativity to to products to get into the product business which is infinitely scalable like Dustin's business. So I think we just, I would just caution people to be a little bit more open-minded. Let me, I know I'm talking a lot. Let me tell you a quick story. No, no, that's why I, we've got you on, Blair. Keep yeah, going. Yeah, this, okay. is, this is great stuff. <laughs> They're bored of hearing us. We tired I was, of our own voices. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking in Adelaide, Australia about six weeks ago. And I've spoken in Adelaide a bunch of times over the years. And uh, there's this little kind of, they drink a lot of wine in Adelaide. It's wine country. So everybody's having a glass of wine before the talk. And this designer comes Sounds up to good. me and he said, I saw you speak eight years ago 
And after your talk, you inspired me to uh, start a launch a gin brand. And I said, oh, <laughs> really? How's it going? He said, well, so I launched the brand. Um, we went, we won some tasting awards. We got national distribution. Then we got international distribution. We're winning international, um, awards. He said a month ago, uh, one block from here, I opened my own bar. It's a ta a gin tasting room. You can look it up. It's prohibition gin in Adelaide, Australia. And he said, I, am, I moved my design studio to the back of the bar. <laughs> 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 And I said, what what, so what did I say to you eight years ago? He said, don't wait for the client. If you've got a great idea, just go do it. And that's what he did. And you look it up and it's, man, they are killing it. They're killing it. Prohibition. Amazing. I love that. And that's where a lot of the stuff designers love, like brand can fit back in. And I've done this. So Blair, my whole career was freelance designer. But my company is nearly six years old now. I did a few other ventures before that. And all of these things were me pouring my creativity into entrepreneurial pursuits. And it's such an asset. I think so many business owners don't have any creativity whatsoever. And that massively hinders them. We had Lauren Homon uh, recently. She's done all of these cool like physical products. And um, she was doing like jars that people put their change in which have now been picked up by Bank of America. And that was like a little side project where she was just using her creativity to go and make something outside of a services business. So I think to me, that sounds incredibly freeing that people yeah. aren't just constrained with client services and they can just dabble in all these areas and go explore whatever, whatever they feel like, basically. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So I know a lot of the listeners are probably in the earlier stages of struggling with this stuff where clients aren't coming super easily. Have you got any like newbies tips? And there are some more, more established people as well in the audience, but I think a ton of people, they're intimidated by it. They don't know where to go. So I, I love what you're talking about, the power dynamics. I love what you're talking about, not being constrained by services. But for the people that are trying to get a service business off the ground, what are some of the key pointers you'd give for these beginners perhaps? Yeah, I you need to go to market thinking like a marketer. And what that means is um, a marketer, well, it's like the definition of marketing, or at least the, mar the definition that I, um, that I like best is marketing is identifying an unmet or poorly met need in the marketplace and then matching a product or service to that need at a profit. So that is the definition. We sometimes think of marketing as promotion, but that's just one of the five, four or five Ps. I think it's up to seven Ps now, but it's one of the original four Ps, promotion. Mar marketing really is the act of identifying what the market needs and then matching something to it at a profit. So most creatives are producers and not marketers. And by that, I mean, they don't, they come out of design school or, or, you know, having worked for their er, earlier in their career and they decide that they want to they want to own a design firm open a design firm and it's because of it's what they know what to do they come at it from the production side it's not because they've looked at the market and thought you know what the world needs the world needs another generalist designer <laughs> 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 right. So if you if you've opened your business because it's your passion or this is what you've always wanted to do or this is what you were trained to do, then you're you're coming at business like a producer and producers have sales and marketing problems. Right. So your frustration around getting business comes from the fact that you're not thinking like a marketer, which takes us back to that first proclamation of the need to specialize. Mm -hmm. Now, the the most successful creative firms that I've ever worked with are ones that are run by non-creative people because they're not emotionally attached to the work, right? So they don't make mm -hmm. these, they make decisions based on fundamental kind of market principles mm -hmm. rather than market emotions. demand, basically. Yeah. That's and as a, as a producer, you're also a crafts, a craftsman or a craftsperson producer, meaning you lovingly hand make what it is that you do and you invest so much of yourself in it. That's not a bad thing at all. I mean, I just, I think I really believe creatives were put on this planet to create, and I believe it's one of the highest calling. So I'm not trying to diminish anybody here. Um, but when, if that's you, if you're this, if you're this craftsperson producer where you invest 
sum of yourself in everything that you do, then selling becomes even more difficult because any yes. rejection is highly personal. Yeah. So my overarching, and it's kind of broad advice, but my broad advice to newbies is you really need to think like a marketer. You need to look at the market and ask, you know, where, where are the unmet or poorly met needs? Mm -hmm. And can I build a business around that? And then, and then trust me when I say that you, you might not be passionate about it. You don't have, don't. I don't, I don't think you should think about what you're passionate about when you're deciding what business to go into. There are other ways to, you don't have to make your passion your business, right? That's mm. not a requirement. And I'm not even sure, I'm not convinced you can tell by the tone of my voice, but I'm not even sure that that's good advice. Mm -hmm. It might be, but I'm not, I'm not convinced of it. So I would just say, set your passion aside, look for the the opportunity in the market, craft a business, a specialized business around the opportunity that you see and see if you develop a passion for solving the problems in that space. Yeah. And if you don't, and if it bores you to death after two or three years, yeah. if you're getting rich and it, and it bores you to death, then, you know, then put a box around your business life and use that cash to fund I'll quote my friend Your David passion. C. Baker, <laughs> a rich and rewarding personal life, mm -hmm. right? Just have this better distinction between your personal mm -hmm. life and your, and your business life. And if it, if it does fuel your passion and you want to blur the lines between your business and your personal life, then that's maybe that's great. Maybe it's a trap you're falling into, but it's your prerogative to do that. So I would say just set your passions aside initially and see see what you become you're going to mm. surprise yourself at, at what you become passionate about do you, do you think two people oftentimes maybe romanticize their passion for something after the fact so sometimes like we had the like um uh tom had said lauren hom i believe how you say it i get yeah it is messed up on her name. <laughs> lauren hom on and she had um she had went to design school not to do lettering but she really got into doing this lettering mm. art and I think she would probably say that's her passion now, but I don't think that was originally her passion. It was just a little side thing she did. And then you start to have some wins under your belt. You start to realize that it's attracting profits and attention. And then you look back and reflect and say, I'm really passionate about lettering. I mean, I find that for myself and I feel like I, I feel like in hindsight, we tend to create a story for ourselves that I was always passionate about this when oftentimes, well, it turned out I wasn't until people started to like, it started to really take off. Then I was passionate. Yeah, you know you know, you know what people seem passionate about? Success. So even if, <laughs> even if you're like, I love lettering more than anything, but for the last decade, I've been sat in a dark room getting no clients, mm. eating like noodles and yeah. poor, you probably aren't feeling that passionate, right? Yeah. But, Pur purpose, yeah. status, success, all of these things that are just so deeply meaningful to human beings, those are things you get passionate about. So what you're saying, Dustin, is I would agree with that. I think there's two things going on there. I think, number one, we're horrible predictors of what we're going to like and what we're going to be passionate about. So get out there and try something, especially if you're young. You're young. You should be trying all kinds of different things. Mm. And then the second thing is, I, I like you, I, I believe we post-rationalize pretty much everything. We behave and then we craft a story or multiple yep. stories, depending on the situation, to explain why we behaved the way we behaved. You're, yep. uh, Dan, Dan Sullivan, founder of Strategic Coach, which is a coaching program for entrepreneurs that I was in for three years ago. He's a very smart man. I'm quoting him all the time. And he says, your past, present, and future are just stories that you tell yourself. So, and you can tell whatever story you want. And I think the older I get, the more I think everything is so subjective. Every single bit of life's experience is subjective. And we, we and we are, we're constantly crafting stories for ourselves and for others about, you know, what our values are, what we believe, what we're passionate about. So just open yourself up to finding be open to falling in love multiple times being passionate about things that you're not even thinking about today yeah well, i love see. it man yeah i mean i was just i was just thinking that you what you were saying i didn't you know the way you've you've actually um worded it is is exactly the process i went through 
um, you know, creating my business and where I am now. I, you know, when I first started out as a graphic designer, I did exactly what you said, you know, finding that that kind of um, sort of hole in the market is what I, the way I would put it. Um, and, you know, crafting my design business around that. And I wasn't necessarily completely in love with, with graphic design, but there were parts about it that I really loved. Um, but I could say now that my passion <laughs> is drawing, which is what I've stopped, you know, I've stopped doing graphic design. But if I hadn't done that first journey of the graphic design business and gone through, you know, the business side of things, I probably wouldn't be able to do my passion for a living today because I wouldn't have learned all those business, you know, side of things. And, and I think I think people make the mistake of wanting to jump into their passion too early without the backing of of what it takes to actually make a business out of it um because i mean i hear what you're saying that that maybe passion shouldn't be mixed with you know the business necessarily i don't know i'm i'm, I'm not sure that i agree with that but i do agree with the fact that we do need to like start from the business side first and then mm -hmm. kind of build up like yeah, great designers okay. tend to be great marketers in general, I've noticed. The ones that are successful yeah, I think financially. So. I, I, you know what like, the weird thing is? Like, like you Lauren don't Hannigan, think that you are. a great copywriter. Sorry. Go exactly. You know, you're right, Dustin. I was like, as, a, as, a, you know, as an artist, I mean, I, I obviously do something right when it comes to marketing, but I never think that I am a marketer, but I must have some kind of business sense. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting, you know, in the position I'm in. But it, it's, I think... It only comes about by you, as you as you were saying, Blair. You've got to try things. You've got to figure out. You can't just sit back and hope that it's all going to fall into your lap. You've got to at least experiment and, as you said, niche down, become an expert, have have those, um, you know, build up that expertise. And then once you've done that, I think, as you said, the freedom, those doors start opening. You actually find there's more freedom when you niche down because then you can start experimenting even further, you know. Well, that's what I found with, with my business. I, f I found that because um, I was a general designer for about 14 years and something that I gave my permission, gave myself permission to do was realize that I actually didn't like a lot of design in terms of like, I didn't actually like doing web design. I didn't actually like doing magazines. I didn't yeah. like doing brochures or <laughs> business cards or whatever that may be. I thought as a designer that I had to be general and had to like all the spectrum of what other jobs came in for me but when I realized that actually there's only a few things I really enjoy doing and I'm just going to focus on those and like you say so it, for me it was a bit like um uh, uh like a sand timer so it was like you know the big bowl was like coming down as I got rid of all those jobs so I was just focusing on one or two things and then as it came through that sort of funnel it opened me up to like working with brands that I'd never done before in you know 14 years it opened up to sort of amazing opportunities and I, you know that sort of experience you know that's what you said about oh it's going to be boring the other side of the door is you know doing that one thing but that one thing has opened up into so many different areas and mm. they've all been really interesting um yeah it's just doing amazing but like I didn't know as I went into that sort of narrowing down of my business that that was going to happen and I suppose uh you know now more people have experienced that you know specializing opens up more opportunities or opens up more interest mm. uh uh I think you know like yeah like you say it's definitely the route to go yeah there if I may there there are and I may have stolen this from Dan Sullivan as well or at least part of it there are there are two stages of success in business and there are sorry, two levels of success. And the, the first level is when you get to like validation, it's people are paying you money. You realize, okay, I've got a business here. Everything's, you know, I could actually continue to earn a living and maybe even make a good living. And the first level of success, you get there through two things or two tools. First, number one, you say yes to pretty much everything. So whatever comes your way, you hmm. say yes to. Oh, I yeah. remember that. Be oh. there. Damn you, damn you <laughs> local restaurant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can, can confirm that's true. But yeah. And yeah. the second Be is there. hard work. Really, really hard work. You just you yeah. work hard and you say yes to everything. The problem is the second level of success 
those tools not only don't help you, they get in the way. And the longer you've been at the first level, the more ingrained those habits of saying yes to everything and working oh, yes. really hard are, the harder it get is to get to the second level of success. Because the second level of success requires you to say no to most things. So you go from saying yes to everything to no to most things. Warren Buffett has this great quote, the difference between successful people and really successful people is really successful people say no to almost everything. So <laughs> you go to from saying yes to saying no, and you go from, you trade hard work for risk. So what I might like, I kind of package up risk to say, to call it innovation. Innovation is creativity plus risk. So Peter Drucker has this quote that I quote every day, in business, all profit comes from risk. So first level of success, when you're starting out, you're saying yes to everything. Therefore, you're very broad. You're building this broad business. You're trying all of these different things. You're seeing what you're good at. You're seeing where there's value in the market. You're seeing what you're passionate about. And you work really hard. You don't, you're trying to build a business. You're trying to build some cash flow. So those are requirements. But then the second level, now you, you, you niche, you become discerning, you start saying no to almost everything. And that's the terror that, you know, as people are trying on specializing, that's the yeah. terror they're feeling is the idea of letting go of all this stuff. Yeah. And then you start to take risks. So my second book, which came out in January of 2018 is called Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. And that's where I show that the people who make real money, back to Drucker's quotes, are the ones who take risks. So you think you have to move past this fee-for-service idea to uh, this focus of like, how do I create the most value for my client and how do I command the most financial reward or return for myself? And the, the firms that make the most money are the ones that start to take risk in their pricing. They start to tie their compensation to the results. So my wife, who is a very hard worker, and she's my business partner in the business, she'll often point out somebody and say, oh, that person's very successful. She must work very hard. And I, like a robot, I reply, no, she must take a lot of risk. Um, Can you um, clarify um, when you say risks and creativity for the people listening, maybe like a couple of different categories of ways that creatives might, different buckets for risks like or different categories of risk? Do you know what yes. I mean? So there's the, there's the risk that the entrepreneur, the job of the entrepreneur is to make bets on the future. Um, so the risks that you take as a business owner are looking out at the horizon, seeing what's changing, and then making shifts in what you do or what the markets you go after, and essentially betting, often betting the entire business on those shifts. That's what entrepreneurship is. So that's a high level of risk. When it comes to your relationship with your clients, um, we all, especially earlier in our careers, we every price you deliver to a client has a risk factor or an uncertainty premium built into it. Right? Sorry, an uncertainty discount. Um, so anytime the client hires you, they're taking on a risk. So if you, I'll just give you a spectrum or two ends of a spectrum of the risk spectrum on how you could charge your client for, let's say a client wants a new, um, website. So on the low risk end of the spectrum for you, where you take no risk and push all the risk to the client, the client comes to you and says, I need a new website. How much? And you say it's $150 an hour. And the client says, okay, well, that's your hourly rate. How many hours will it take? And you say, I don't know. That's really on you. Well, I think it's going to take between $10,000 and $20,000, but I'm pushing all the risk onto you. You're just paying my rate. That's, that's the low end of the spectrum where you're pushing all of the risk to the client. And the client's risk that they're taking on is they don't know if it's going to be ten or twenty or $30,000 because you're pushing all the risk to them. So they're taking the risk. Because you're taking no risk in this situation, all you can command is essentially your hourly rate. On the other end of the spectrum, you might, let's say a client comes to you and says, I need a new website. And you say, why do you need a new website? Oh, we're trying to go into this new market and we're, we want to launch this new product. Oh, okay. Well, what's the size of that market? <clears throat> it's a billion dollars. And what's, what do you expect? If everything goes well, what do you expect that your share, you could capture for share of market? I think in two years, we could have 20% of that market. So you're saying in two years, you could have $200 million in sales. Yeah. What are your profit margins? 20%. 
So $40 million in profit in two years. Yeah. So if we do this website right, really well, we're going to help you create $40 million in profit. And then it recurring at that point. Yeah. Now you start to think, hmm, I could sell ours, right? Or I could say, tell you what, this is just... So, so I'm giving you the two points at the extreme ends of the spectrum, and then there's an infinite number of variables, different ways to price in between. In between. Yep. Yeah. But at this end of the spectrum, you could say, you don't pay me anything up front. You're going to pay me a percentage of sales, or we're going to help you get to $40 million in profit. And when we hit $40 million in profit, you're going to pay us $6 million. And so again, as you're thinking, well, that sounds risky. Yeah, that's where that's with you taking all the risk. The previous mm -hmm. example is with the client taking all the risk. Now, in between, there's an infinite number of ways that you could price and you could take a little bit of risk. And the more mm -hmm. risk you're willing to take, the more money you're likely to make. And also, like you, that, yeah, oh, sorry. I was yeah. going to oh, say, go it's, like, and it's like that gap of $150 an hour and all the way to the other side of the spectrum, that gap is the risk. And it's like all profit as it goes up in this gap. So you kind of choose where can I feel comfortable? Yeah. I love it. Bla Blair, I, honestly, we could talk to you for about three hours. I feel I do hope mm. that you're <laughs> hopefully willing to come back on the show in the future because we would love to keep the discussion going. I know you have to run in uh, about five minutes or so. Um, I'm slightly scared. Um <laughs> In fact, yeah, let's let's hopefully have you back in the future because I would love to delve into some of this stuff more, but it's been incredibly insightful. For now, where can the dear listeners find you online? Where can, where can they discover what you're working on? Yeah, th thank you. And it's, this has been great. What For host for a podcast, when I got on here, I thought, oh, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a great format. I've really enjoyed talking to the four of you and getting your different okay. points of view. Likewise. Um, Thank you. Uh, listeners can find me at winwithoutpitching.com. Um, my own podcast is called Two Bobs, the number two Bobs. It's an inside joke. If you can tell me why it's named that, then there's a prize. And I Money? do it with uh, no, <laughs> I do it with my good friend and co-host uh, David C. Baker. Uh, my book, Pricing Creativity, you can only get at pricingcreativity.com, and the Win Without Pitching Manifesto you'll find at Amazon. But I'm at winwithoutpitching.com, yeah. and I'm. Blair ends on LinkedIn and Twitter. Incredible. Thank you so much, Blair. That was thank you. amazing. Yeah, that was really, great. really appreciate your time. And thank yeah. you for joining us. That Thanks, guys. I really thank enjoyed you. it. Take care, buddy. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, you can find full show notes over at honestdesigners.com or find us over on iTunes and now Spotify by searching for The Honest Designers Show. And remember, we're now on social media too if you search for Honest Designers. If today's episode helped you, then it would mean the world to us if you took just a moment to leave us a quick review over on iTunes as this is one of the best ways for other designers to discover the show. Thanks again for tuning in and we will see you next week right here on The Honest Designers Show.